Okay, so Dave has uh, covered uh, the new reference data, and we're moving on to part two, which is to address the question you might have of, okay, do we need a new protocol? So the full title is Calibrating the Output of a Linear Accelerator, TG51 Updated. Uh, my name is Malcolm McEwen. I'm uh, at the Ionization Standards Group at the National Research Council in Canada. Uh, because this is a joint meeting, I'll be highlighting Canada as much as possible. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to do a digression about mentoring. Um, Dave has been a great mentor to a, a large number of us uh, in the Ottawa area over the years, and he's been a real champion of TG51. And the thing about a mentor is that they pass on their, their uh, knowledge, but they also pass on their way of doing things. And a quick survey in the pub last night indicated that uh, he's really passed on his skills So, back to more serious business. Um, this is what we're talking about, uh, the APM TG51 protocol. Um, Dave's covered it, really. I won't say anything here. I'll just highlight the bottom point. Um, it's been widely adopted in North America since its inception. This is data from the RPC, and you can see that we're, uh, as of yes, last year, it's up to 94% of institutions in North America are using TG51. So... Um, it's the protocol that people are using and legitimate to ask the question um, of what we need to do next. I don't really need to do this because Dave very nicely covered it. Um, so uh, that's in the handout. I'll not go into any detail. I'll just make, highlight Canada again. <laughs> so question, why update um, if it's so good or if it's been used everywhere? And the real thing is down here, if you can read it. It's September 1999, so 12 years have gone by. Seems a reasonable time to ask the question of whether it needs to be replaced. Uh, so the working group, as Dave mentioned, has been formed, and it recommends the following. Um, photons, there are some updates required. Uh, new chambers have come on the market. Uh, need a review of calculated KQs, which Dave has actually gone over very nicely. Um, uh, we need an uncertainty analysis, and we need some uh, AAPM official guidance clarification on the protocol. Uh, so that's for photons. Uh, for electrons, uh, a more widespread revision is required, and Dave alluded to that with one uh, plot where the P-wall is very different from the assumptions of unity in TG51. Uh, at the end of this talk, I'll just uh, talk briefly about the electron progress and where we need to go. So the photon addendum. There is a photon addendum. It is coming, and it will cover the following. Uh, simply KQ factors for new chambers calculated with Monte Carlo, and I'll not go into that at all because it's been covered in great detail. Uh, recommendations for imp implementation, uncertainty analysis, and a comparison of measured and calculated KQ factors. And for this presentation, I'm just going to look at the central two, because those are the really ones that you're going to be interested in, I think. So just to be clear what stays with TG51, the procedure remains unchanged. Uh, you don't have to worry there. Uh, it remains based on a calibration coefficient in cobalt 60. The ADCL uh, operation won't change either. They'll still provide you with a calibration coefficient in cobalt 60. Um, some laboratories, uh, including the NRC in Canada, can provide MV calibrations, uh, but the effort required to do that for 1,500 clinics uh, isn't really there. Um, related to that, um, we're going to be still using calculated KQ factors um, it's much easier to deal with new chamber types and just to calculate all the factors with KQ. And I'll go into a little more detail. Uh, DD10 will remain the beam quality specifier. So the uh, first of those sections that I'm going to go through are the recommendations uh, for implementation that are in the new addendum. And they're here related to implementation, KQ data sets, uh, definition of a reference class ionization chamber, uh, some recommendations about polarizing voltage and polarity, uh, effective point of measurement, small chambers, non-water phantoms, and flattening filter-free Linux. I'll just go through those uh, one at a time. So the basic uh, uh, 
guidance for implementation is you should implement the addendum when it's out. Um, the good news is the changes are minor, so the effort required, we believe, should be fairly straightforward. Um, soon new, new equipment may be required because of some of the other recommendations. Um, and uh, Dave talked about this. Um, the development of the uncertainty budget may take some time, but the actual procedure will remain very, very similar in how long it will take you to implement on an annual basis. Moving on to KQ data sets. Um, for the chain, the, so you'll have TG51, which is still valid, uh, but there'll be addendum and it will have KQ data. And the recommendation is if there's KQ data in the new uh, addendum for your chamber, you should use that data. Um, if you've got a chamber that's not listed either in the new addendum or in the original document, um, there is a section in TG51, and I've just copied it in here, of how to obtain a KQ da uh, data set from those that are published in the, in the protocol. Uh, and I've just highlighted two areas um, that of how you, um, uh, how you judge uh, what KQ data set to use for a non-listed chamber. Um, so that's given. But actually more important is the second sentence down here, that basically you can't just look it up and pick out your data. You have to confirm that your choice was correct by comparison effectively with the chamber that is listed. So the shorthand of that is get a chamber that's listed. Uh, so this is where some of the change will come in. Um, the addendum is uh, developing a proposed chamber spec for a reference class ionization chamber. Um, in the discussion that follows, uh, there are three subtypes that we've uh, defined. Uh, 0.6 cc reference chambers. These are the standard NE2571, uh, PRO6C, A12 that you're familiar with. Um, the 0.125 cc scanning chambers, these are the chambers used for commissioning uh, the CC13, the PTW31010, uh, those kind of chambers. And then we have the micro chambers, which we've defined as 0.02 cc or less, uh, the A16, the PTW pinpoint chambers, the IBA CC01. So when I'm talking about reference scanning or micro, keep those definitions in mind. Uh, just be examples, uh, just uh, clearly there uh, for the chamber types, uh, PTW31010, scanning chamber, one of the micro chambers, uh, extracting A12, and then the um, a number of manufacturers make these uh, what are pharma chambers but with a shorter thimble, um, and these really we count in with the 0.6 cc chambers, the, being the only difference being the length of the uh, thimble. So this is the proposed chamber spec, and it's based on completely an objective assessment of the chamber's performance, and it lays out a number of measurements that the chamber has to meet. Um, chamber settling is something that's been in the literature of how long a chamber achieves equilibration, um, and we make a statement about how big the offset when you irradiate a chamber and when it reaches equilibration, how big a difference that is, and we set a limit of 0.5%. Uh, leakage can be a concern, especially as these very small chambers have a very small signal, the leakage can become significant. And uh, in a session yesterday, Rock Mackey talked about that for small fields. Uh, the polarity should be small um, and also shouldn't vary across beams. Uh, so we, we have two uh, limits there. And then there's some discussion of iron recombination. Um, uh, the correction should be linear with dose per pulse. This means it should follow the Bogue theory. Um, the initial recombination component should be small. Um, there shouldn't be a huge difference between collecting negative or positive charge, and this isn't always the case. Um, and then finally, a uh, statement about chamber stability, uh, and that's basically that a chamber, if it's going to be a reference class, needs to be stable over multiple years. Um, and I'll, we'll talk about all of these as, a, as we go along. Um, so based on the on that chamber spec, we can state the following, that the chambers there all meet uh, the requirements. Those are chambers that we have data for. Um, so as you may be scanning them, it's fairly obvious a lot of them are 0.6 cc pharma chambers. Um, just highlight five are scanning chambers um, and no micro chambers. Um, so there's only two classes of our definition that meet a reference class uh, standard. 0.6 cc pharma chambers uh, and some scanning chambers, but not all. Um, 
no micro chambers and no A150 chambers. And the reason for A150 being excluded is that it's uh, hygroscopic and there's data in the lit literature that show big variations depending on how the chamber's stored and your environmental conditions, which mean that it makes it very difficult to monitor the stability of the calibration coefficient. A uh, reasonable question to ask, what about parallel plate chambers? Um, TG51 had no photon data, uh, and partly that was that studies at the time had shown large variations in the performance of parallel plate chambers in cobalt. Uh, there was very little information on MV. Um, this is a graph from some data from the MPL in the UK. Uh, and just to summarize, we saw larger variations between chambers of the same type and much larger polarity corrections. There was no strong reason to use these chambers in MV beams. Uh, that was early 2000s. Um, there shouldn't be anything inherently wrong about using a parallel plate chamber in photon beams. And indeed, uh, recent uh, data from last year suggest much better performance with uh, new models. Uh, this is data from the uh, German Standards Laboratory presented last year, and uh, the graph shows for the IBA PPC05. Uh, they calibrated 10 chambers uh, at three energies and got uh, pretty good repeatability, larger than for cylindrical chambers of the same type that we see, but uh, much, getting much closer to reference class performance. Um, and the graph on the right shows both chamber settling effects, which can be very large, and the polarity correction. I'd just like to point you also, there's a poster downstairs on some work that uh, Brian Muir's been doing on this, uh, both Monte Carlo and measurements. So I'd uh, I suggest you go and look at that if you're interested. So to summarize that, there still aren't going to be KQ factors in the addendum for parallel plate chambers in photon beams, uh, underlined in photon beams, because this does not imply anything about electron dosimetry. It's just uh, the decision that there'll be use a, use a thimble chamber in photon beams. Moving on to polarizing voltage, um, just want to highlight that this is the equation for a fully corrected ion chamber reading, and uh, there are two corrections which are directly uh, related to the polarizing voltage. Um, talking about recombination first, um, the correction, there's been a lot of work done on it. Um, it's well established how to measure it, but it's not always straightforward to get the right value for every chamber. Uh, TG51 uses the two-voltage technique, and for a chamber that's performing well, that's fine, but you have to do more to uh, actually confirm that your chamber is performing correctly. And there are many examples of anomalous behavior in the literature. Uh, this is from uh, Francois de Bois at uh, McGill from 2000, showing a big deviation from what should be expected of a linear response of the inverse of the polarizing voltage, the inverse of the ionization current, and uh, that group showed uh, that this occurred for a number of chambers in a whole range of beams. Uh, this is data from uh, uh, the NRC group from last year, and this is showing that the recombination correction is different whether you collect a negative or positive charge, and the theory just doesn't take account of that uh, present. Um, and this graph shows um, basically whether the chamber uh, recombination correction uh, is consistent with Bogue theory according to its effective electrode separation. And what we see is that for most chambers, uh, they follow uh, what's called the good chambers, but this uh, CCO4, the correction was much larger than would have been expected for the uh, plate separation. So based on the literature, we can say not all chambers follow the standard theory. Um, you have to be careful with manufacturer's statements that uh, may be based on safety and not on actual correct operation. Um, don't always be thinking that a higher polarizing voltage gives you a lower cor uh, recombination correction, so that should be good. It may actually give you a larger correction or actually give you an error. Uh, so the recommendation will be for the chambers that are recommended as reference class, 300 volts is the largest voltage you should apply and you may need to go to a lower voltage if you characterize your chamber and find that it's not performing as the theory would suggest. Um, related to this is polarity. Um, 
I'm not going to go into this slide, but uh, you can find various reasons why there's a polarity effect. Uh, you can read the handout to uh, go through that. Uh, bottom line is that polarity effect is related to net deposition of charge. In a photon beam, we have transient charge particle equilibrium, past D max. And so the polarity correction we would expect to be small. There is no net charge being deposited in the chamber. Um, but I'd just like to point out it's not zero and uh, uh, can be very close, as we see with some of these chambers, uh, but it often is not zero. We need to measure it. Um, highlight here the, some of the micro chambers. These are mean values, and we're seeing something larger than our spec and uh, not nothing like consistent as the, uh, the, the larger chambers. Uh, this is more recent data for parallel plate chambers, and they're all looking small except for perhaps one chamber. Uh, so recommendation on polarity, don't assume it's a uh, unity, uh, measure it. It doesn't take very long. And uh, one of the reasons that I would really plug to do polarity correction is that it's, a, it's actually a very good QA check. Confirms that you've applied the polarization voltage correctly. Not always done. Confirms your cable's working. Um, the other thing is that NDW uh, calibration coefficients that you get from um, the calibration lab are very de dependent on the chamber volume, and that's manufacturer independent. We see from the data that we have that the polarity correction is often very, very consistent across chambers of the same type. So if you measure your polarity correction, it's different from what's in the literature. It may give you an indication that your chamber's not performing as expected if that's the case, then perhaps the KQs that are published don't apply to your chamber and you need to do some more measurements. Uh, and then if you measure uh, polarity correction regularly, any change in that is a good indication that there may be a change in your chamber response. Uh, so moving on, uh, Dave mentioned that uh, the effective point of measurement is really only needed in the photon part for measuring the depth dose curve. Uh, TG51 says 0.6 times uh, radius of the cavity, and some recent uh, uh, investigations suggest it isn't the case. These are results from uh, Frederick Tessier and Ivan Kavrikov, Monte Carlo calculations for a range of chambers. Uh, two things to take from this. The EPOM is not 0.6 for any chamber, and it's not constant either for all chambers. So for some of these chambers, it's as small as 0.1 or 0.2R, for the 0.6 cc chambers, they're fairly consistent at about 0.5 R. This is a, an add-on to that work to verify that you could change the EPOM. Um, and this is uh, the thick black line is a Roos uh, parallel plate chamber as our reference. Uh, the green is the standard A1SL. And this is just to confirm the Monte Carlo calculations that if you change the wall thickness, you can change the effective point of measurement. Um, just an interesting verification of that. Um, uh, and then there's a poster downstairs by this group, and this paper came out in PMB in the last month, an experimental verification or measurement of uh, EPOM values and uh, pretty good uh, agreement between the Monte Carlo calculations and the measurements suggesting that the 0.6R is not universal. The good news, as Dave said, is that for doing your TG51 calculation uh, determination, uh, there is no need to worry about your EPOM. Uh, so for TG51, the recommendation is don't need to worry, but if you're, for your depth dose curves, um, the 0.6R could give you significant differences, especially on the build-up portion of your, build of your depth dose curve. Uh, just something on use of small volume chambers. These are the micro chambers, uh, less than 0.05 cc. Um, they're not recommended for reference dosimetry because they don't meet the specification. And these are some of the issues that we saw. Not all the chambers have all the issues, but collectively they all have at least one of those uh, anomalous behaviors. Uh, and just for small fields, uh, some of those effects will impact small field relative dosimetry. Uh, and so the, the work that we've, we've done in here suggests that when you're using these chambers in uh, relative dosimetry, you still need to worry about some of the uh, performance characteristics. Solid phantoms. Um, solid phantoms are nice 
for a number of reasons. Uh, not spilling water, you don't have leaks, don't have a shorting of electrical equipment, uh, much easier to move, tend to be smaller, uh, give you robust SSS. SSD, um, and the new reference grade formulations look to be very water equivalent. So uh, on that side, it looks like to be, why, why not use them? Disadvantages, even the reference grade uh, are not truly water equivalent for all beams. Um, it can be an issue to distinguish formulations um, of whether you, you have the right formulation. Uh, homogeneity is not guaranteed, and to characterize the phantom can be time-consuming. So on reflection, the, uh, the working group and the addendum will make the recommendation that water remains the reference material for TG51 calculations, uh, determinations. Uh, just to follow on from what Dave talked about with uh, beam quality for flattening filter-free Linux, there are two issues. Uh, and as you said, that using DD10X, uh, there's no difference between a flattening filter-free and a with flattening filter uh, Linac. Uh, so that basically says that DD10X is, a, is the right beam quality to select stopping powers. Uh, and uh, just show you if you use TPR, which is used in Europe, uh, then you do get a separation between the two uh, types of machine. And this was seen um, in the 90s with uh, research Linux, which had soft, unfiltered beams that uh, uh, TPR was degenerate in selecting uh, KQ factors. The other issue for uh, TG51 with uh, FFF Linux is uh, related to the measurement, either dose averaging. Um, this graph shows how peaked uh, a 15x uh, without a flattening filter is, and your farmer chamber is going to average a large portion of that, and therefore there will be a correction for dose averaging. And the other one is that ion recombination can be much more significant. Uh, this one, the measurements here, suggested as much as 5%. Uh, so the, uh, the concept that with a farmer chamber, my PIN is small and it's accurate, fall apart when you change the technology in this way. So just a reminder here that you need to make sure you know how your Linux is working um, and do the measurements necessary to characterize it. A uh, question on the lead foil that's come up. Um, certainly we, we've heard it a number of times that the Use of the one millimeter lead sheet to determine in DD10X uh, can lead to operational errors of when you use it, when you take it out. And there's an interim measure in TG51 to calculate the DD10X from DD10. Uh, and the question the working group are looking at is can that become a default rather than interim? Uh, and RPC has some interesting data that they published in 2003 and the uh, the important column here is the difference in the KQ, whether they did it uh, the correct way with the lead foil or used the interim equation. And the differences are small. Um, so we want to get some more data for multiple uh, Linux manufacturers, but there's a looking strong suggestion that you'll be able to just use a DD10 measurement to select your KQ, to determine your DD10X and then select your KQ. Um, just to be clear, we're not writing a best practice guide. Um, that will take a very long time. Uh, and the RPC has basically done a lot of this already. i uh, point you to two publications. Uh, this one is from JACMP in 2003, and this is from the uh, AAPM Summer School 2009. Uh, so maybe the recommendation also should be that you buy 2009 Summer School to uh, implement the addendum. So that's the end of the recommendations. Uh, they're, not, um, they're not huge and then don't have far-reaching consequences. Um, this section is something that's perhaps much newer um, and will take a bit more time in the implementation, and that's to de determine a complete uncertainty budget for your dose measurement. Uh, TG51 didn't have uncertainties, and that was deliberate. Um, other protocols have put uncertainty budgets in with relatively differing amounts of detail, uh, and we feel it's time to, to give some guidance and give some typical values. And the ISO GUM is the starting point. Uh, what is that? It's the guide to the expression of uncertainty in measurement. 
and it's the procedure to estimate the total uncertainty in your measurement. It's actually a long document and gives you more than you really need to know. Uh, it covers all measurements, so situations where you have multiple correlations and uh, things which are much more complicated than we actually have for this situation. Uh, it is the right way to do it, but uh, its complexity has indicated that people have produced explanatory documents to a guide to the guide, which seems counterintuitive. Um, and TG138 brought out a specific document for brachytherapy. So we, we feel that one for reference dosimetry is, is needed. Um, what this section of the addendum has, a discussion of type A and type B uncertainties, an uncertainty budget, and typical values. And uh, this last point, I think, is important. Uh, I'm from a standards lab, and for us, a measurement without an uncertainty is valueless. And uncertainties um, do lead to improved uh, reporting in QA and allow better comparisons between centers. Without the uncertainty, you can't really make any judgment. So it's a useful QA tool. Um, again, the summer school has a chapter on uncertainties. Uh, uh, and just to briefly highlight, in the, uh, in the ISO guide, there are two types of uncertainty, type A and type B. These are not the same as random and systematic. They're just type A or type B, depending on how you estimate them. Both types require analysis by the scientist. So let's look at the uncertainty analysis now for a, a few minutes. Uh, the equations for TG51 are pretty straightforward. Uh, top one's how you get your dose, and the second one just uh, is your fully corrected ion chamber reading. They're linear equations, and we can assume reasonably that they're independent variables. So the uncertainty analysis is, is basically a summation. Um, we expand for the addendum the uh, ion chamber measurement to include leakage, uh, the effect of dose averaging in, in the off-axis directions, and some discussion of humidity. So let's look at a couple of examples. And the first one is uh, the, the ion chamber reading. And I've written it this way uh, because what you do is when you do your setup, this is related to your geometric setup. Um, wherever you position that chamber, you actually assign it to be on axis, uh, on X and Y, at 10 centimeters, the DREF, for a 1 meter SSD and a fuel size of 10 by 10, because that's your reference conditions. But by writing it out this way, we actually begin to look at how to estimate our uncertainty. Um, we see that we're actually dependent on these, and then we can estimate the uncertainty component for each of those uh, dependencies on off-axis position if that's not aligned properly, how precise you are at DREF, your SSD, and your field size. So the great thing about an uncertainty analysis is it's also a procedural review. It actually, by going through the uncertainty budget, you actually go step by step through your measurements. Um, so it's valuable not just getting a, an uncertainty value of actually a procedural review of what you're doing. Uh, temperature pressure, uh, similarly, you can uh, you look at the, the correction, um, and I'd recommend SI units as a standards lab, uh, so degrees C, uh, kilopascal. Um, so what do you need? Well, you need clearly calibrated meters with sufficient resolution. Uh, for water, you want the temperature of the water at the ion chamber, so your water shouldn't be uh, drifting in temperature. It should have been left in the room long enough to... Uh, not have big gradients. Your ion chamber should be in, in equilibrium with the water. And just a note there that uh, you may have to worry about ion chamber uh, thimble expansion if you want to be really precise. From pressure, um, we, we want the pressure in the thimble, but it's only realistic to measure it in the room. And therefore, we need to have some uh, confidence that our chamber is communicating with the outside air. And I just point out that... Uh, all of the ADCLs, when they calibrate a chamber, actually check this. It's a requirement to ensure that your chamber is uh, basically linked to the outside air. It's just a quick plot on thermal equilibration from a 2004 paper of Das and Zhu. And this just shows how quickly a chamber comes to equilibrium with uh, the water phantom. Uh, so the chamber was very 
uh, was at room temperature, but the water was cold. Um, and so things are pretty quick, but it's not instantaneous. So you do have to wait sort of five, ten minutes at least. Uh, looking at this, a conservative estimate would be 15, should be enough to ensure your chamber is at the temperature that you're measuring with your thermometer in the water. Another example, uh, ion chamber stability. This is the equation to give you the dose to water. Uh, but there's really a time dependence in there, and it's written out here that you're measuring your dose at some TT measure, but your NDW, it corresponds to some other time. And then you have to, the underlying assumption in this equation is that the difference in time makes no difference, but you need to... Uh, so have some way of, of uh, measuring that assumption, quantifying it. The uh, addendum is going to recommend three ways. Uh, the best way, uh, we would say, is to use a Cobalt 60 beam, exactly like you're getting your calibrations, so that's a very consistent check. Cobalt 60 is not uh, available a lot of places now. Um, so the second preference is to use a set of reference ionization chambers and to compare them. If you do that on a regular basis, you can monitor stability. Clearly, you need three chambers as a minimum. Not all of them have to be calibrated, but they all have to be reference class. And the third option is to use a strontium-90 check source. And there's various uh, publications in the literature about this. Uh, I picked this data from Bassett L in PMB, and this shows over uh, more than 10 years uh, stability of a chamber uh, using strontium-90. And there is some variations, but other, uh, um, generally is, uh, the system is working well. Um, if you use cobalt, you get your, uh, your variations tend to be, from our experience, about 0.05%. So it's, strontium isn't as good due to the uh, geometry. And just to follow that up, that a calibration certificate every two years without intermediate, intermediate monitoring is basically worthless because you have no way of knowing that your chamber is stable or not. Um, and the caveat is also to that is that you can't assume your reference class chamber is stable until you've monitored it. These are generally going to be small effects um, from what we have experience of, but it's, uh, it's still your responsibility as the user to ensure that, you're, that you know what your chamber is doing. So uh, the addendum produces an uncertainty budget and provides two scenarios. One, a kind of not state-of-the-art, but a well-constructed, uh, well-evaluated uh, uncertainty budget with reference class equipment. And then, not a worst case, but a what we believe to be realistic, where people are perhaps pressed for time, don't have access to all of the reference class equipment, and it's designed to show you the kind of differences that the, uh, the user can impact on the overall uncertainty. Uh, so this is the... Uh, the the one for the first scenario, the, the reference class, well evaluated. And the, uh, the bottom uh, line is that the overall uncertainty is about 0.9%, and the majority of that is actually tied, tied up in the Cobalt 60 NDW and the KQ factors, which you have no control over. Uh, if you do it well, you can get the user component down to 0.3%, which is basically uh, almost insignificant compared to uh, the absolute uncertainties from the calibration. The second scenario, the uh, overall uncertainty can go up by a factor of three um, due to some of the uh, assumptions or the poor equipment that could be used. Uh, what's possible in uncertainties, and here's a plug for Canada again, um, we offer Embry calibrations, um, and in that respect there are no uh, KQ factors required. You have an NDW for the beam that you're actually uh, using. And then uh, what happens is that we have a reduced uncertainty in our NDW directly from the primary standards laboratory. We have no uncertainty because there's no KQ factor, and now our uncertainty overall comes down to 0.5%. So this is basically at the moment how, how low you can do a TG51 uh, dose measurement using a, a direct uh, NDW calibration. As I said earlier, rolling this out uh, across the whole of North America is unrealistic, but the service will be available, uh, I think, in the U.S. as well from NIST, so that perhaps research institutes may wish uh, to use it. 
So that's the end of uh, everything I'm going to say about the photon addendum. Uh, just for this uh, last section, just highlight some of the issues for electron dosimetry and some uh, recent data. Basic equation is the same, um, and KQ is split into three components. Uh, the uh, gradient of correction uh, that Dave has talked about, and then one correction to go from cobalt-60 to high-energy electrons, and a second correction basically to deal with the energy dependence in electron beams. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, more of a revision is required for the electron side, um, and all three components need looking at uh, the photon calculations of the effective point of measurement mean that the P gradient needs to be revisited. Um, there are improved values for KE Cal coming online, both from Monte Carlo calculations and from direct measurements from primary standards laboratories. Um, and K prime R50 in TG51 assumed unity perturbation corrections, and that's been shown not to be the case. So here's some data uh, from the uh, McGill group, for Haag and et al., um, from Leslie Buckley and Dave Rogers, uh, 2006. And this is showing uh, how the P wall correction gets very, very large as we go down the depth dose curve, um, very much not unity. Uh, from Araki uh, in Japan, uh, calculations of P wall at D ref. And again, this backs up what Dave showed that Corrections of up to 2% we're seeing for the low energy electron beams. Uh, paper from the uh, group in Quebec City using a scintillating fiber to experimentally verify these calculations. Um, and they showed very nicely that the uh, experiments uh, here were, were matching closely to these large corrections, uh, 5 10% that the Monte Carlo was seeing. Um, the experiment also began to look at whether by choosing a, an EPOM uh, judiciously you could actually remove a large portion of this P-wall, and the data suggested that was the case. Uh, this is data from uh, our group at NRC using uh, electron beam calorimetry and uh, Fricker dosimetry to measure k prime R50, and you see in the blue line what TG51 says, and the Fricka agreeing at high energies where you'd expect it to do, but as we go to low energies, the, uh, there's a difference, and not the 2% uh, that Monte Carlo is indicating, but at least 1% uh, for this beam. Uh, if we extract the uh, P wall and compare it with, uh, with recent Monte Carlo from Zinc and Wolf, as good indication that Monte Carlo is still right. Uh, I have to, every time I do a measurement, I'm more, more convinced Monte Carlo is right, which makes me uncomfortable as an experimentalist. Um, this is early days, though. Uh, more, more work is required. Uh, the number of labs working on primary standards for electron beam is fairly small. Uh, one of the other issues for electron beams that's been raised is how low in energy can you use a cylindrical chamber? A number of protocols worldwide say you have to use parallel plate chambers for low energies. TG51 allows it down to about 6 MeV. Uh, and what we want to do is objectively answer the question of which is the better route. And for that, we need some data. I just want to show you to finish. Um, this is a very recent paper um, from a Japanese group uh, basically asking the question that uh, parallel plate chambers have a large perturbation. Cylindrical chambers have a large perturbation. Is it any worse? And their data for depth dose curves would suggest that it's probably no worse than using a parallel plate chamber. Uh, but their work is MC only. But uh, that's an indication that maybe we can go to lower energies for cylindrical chambers. Um, this is some data from our lab uh, just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, um, and we took five pharma chambers and in an 8 MeV electron beam and plotted depth dose curves. Um, and our positioning uncertainty on this is sub 0.1 millimeter. So then we can actually take ratios. Uh, and if we do that and plot it as a function of EZ, we actually see that uh, if, if this is a half percent deviation from D max, 
we can get down below 6 MeV with pharma chambers all having the same perturbation. And that was a concern that the perturbation correction would be chamber dependent. And this data, which is very early, I have to admit, but it would suggest that there isn't a large variation from chamber to chamber for uh, pharma chambers, even from different manufacturers and different uh, eras. So to conclude, uh, and we've got time for quite a few questions. Um, following on from the uh, discussions yesterday about research, there's still a lot of interesting stuff going on in reference to symmetry. It's not a completely closed book. Um, TG51, uh, in reviewing it 12 years on, is still looking pretty good, uh, as good as Dave is looking, actually. Uh, um, some changes are required both photons and electrons. Uh, the, the changes are small for photons and will be out pretty soon as long as we just go through the uh, AFM approval process. Uh, electrons will follow on in the next couple of years. Uh, so keep an eye out for published addenda. And uh, thank you for your attention.